This is Battleground PA, a Penn Live podcast discussing the issues that matter to Pennsylvanians and documenting the events in the Keystone State and beyond that could shape how you vote in the 2024 elections. Well, hello again, everyone. This is Joyce Davis. I'm Penn Live's outreach and opinion editor, and this is Battleground PA. We are at the game here trying to determine just where, how Pennsylvania voters are going to stand in the 2024 elections. And to have us once again think through all of the difficult issues facing our state and our nation is the wonderful Jeffrey Lord. Welcome, Jeffrey. It's good to have you back from vacation. It's been a long time. Good to be here. There's nothing like coming home. (laughs) <laughs> After a wonderful vacation, I guess you're right. Jeffrey is, of course, uh, it represents as a rep- Republican analyst and comes and offers his thoughts for us on a generally weekly basis unless he's on vacation. But today, we are absolutely thrilled to have with us um, a special guest. And our special guest is Will Cooper. Uh, Will Cooper, I'm going to read from his book the description here. He's an attorney, a national columnist, an award-winning author. His commentary has appeared in hundreds of publications around the world, including the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN. We go on and on and on and on. And this book that we are going to talk about today, How America Works and Why It Doesn't, is provocative. It is truly provocative, but it helps, as I told him before we started, it really helps us think deeply about some of the issues that we are all grappling with as we head into um, the polls uh, in November. So we'll welcome once again. And I guess the first question that Jeffrey and I want to throw out to you is, what are you trying to say in this book? <laughs> I mean, what are you telling <laughs> the American people? <laughs> well, thank you, Joyce. Really great to be here. Appreciate you having me on. And Jeffrey, great to connect with you as well. Look forward to talking about this. Uh, The main point behind the book is to really get people to think. I mean, your reaction that you just outlined, Joyce, that you find it provocative, that it raises good questions, makes me feel great because that's what I want. I know I'm not going to change hearts and minds on some grand scale. It's just not going to happen. But if I can get people to think and talk in a nice way about important issues, I think it's a win. So I'm great to... Great to be here and hopefully we can do just that, talk about these important issues. Well, one of the first questions I had, and you start off the book um, actually in a way that is very sensible, but that is not uh, that many Americans would object to, right? You start off and you tell us there's good things about the constitution and there's bad things about the, bad things about our constitution. Come on now, Will, why, (laughs) what do you see wrong with the American constitution? Well, in my view, the Constitution should be both the original Constitution, should be both condemned in certain ways and celebrated. So it's an irony of human history that the same document made some really big mistakes and also set up a system of government that has dramatically increased human flourishing over time. Your question about the negative side, I mean, I think the three-fifths clause and the slave trade clause which have since been overturned by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, I think most of us can agree those were not good clauses and that that has been a part of our history, those provisions and the aftermath of those provisions. So that's an example of something that hopefully everybody can agree wasn't a good thing. I also think the Second Amendment, another example, is a perfectly valid constitutional provision. I think that the critics who say it should be construed into a nullity by the Supreme Court are making a mistake, but I think the impact of it has been really harmful over time. And if you just look at the data on on gun deaths, it shows that the United States has a lot more per capita gun deaths. And I think the Second Amendment plays a role in that, those consequences. So those are some examples, uh, Joyce, of provisions that I don't think we should celebrate. Jeffrey, you you heard what he said about, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are on the Constitution actually not being a perfect 100% Bible document. What are your thoughts on that, Jeffrey? 
Well, I am what is known, uh, this would be a curse word in some quarters, an originalist. Uh, I, uh, I, and, and Joyce, I may have said this to you before, as as uh, Will may or may not know, I am not a lawyer, um, but it fell to me in the White, Reagan White House political office to work on the Supreme Court nominations of five uh, Reagan nominees, including the uh, big battle over Robert Bork. And I must say, I learned a lot. Uh, you, you couldn't be around Antonin Scalia and and not learn you know a great deal about the, his views on the constitution and all of this kind of thing um which i think is important i just think that whether it's the constitution of the united states or the constitution of your local uh, whatever club you you have a constitution for a reason to sort of give the guidelines and the rules etc but you also have to have an escape hatch uh, you know, so that you have the ability to change. And, you know, the one thing that I always come back to is that uh, there is no human being on earth who's perfect. And that goes in spades for multiples of human beings uh, yes. gathered together. Uh, right. So so what we have to learn with is the imperfections. And over time, uh, is something that is egregiously wrong, as slavery was, for example, um, you have to correct it. We've been through that period. We've done it. But that doesn't mean that there are not still things to, to do. But it doesn't mean, as well, it doesn't mean that at some point we're going to reach a point of perfection. That perfection is an, is an illusion. No single person on this earth uh, is perfect. And so, therefore, in the collective, we're not going to be perfect either. And therefore, our Constitution is not going to be perfect. But I'll tell you, one of the things that uh, Will discusses in the book is how hard it is to change the Constitution and whether that should be something that we think about. I'll tell you, we do disagree on this one, Jeffrey, because I am truly of the opinion that I, except for the Bible, because I'm really a faithful woman, I don't think a document written all those you know, centuries ago is something that's really needs to be, I mean, you need to keep refining this thing for the modern world. I don't, I, I'm not one of those who looks back at the constitution and says it should not be updated with the ages. So Will, come on in here and tell us about that. What, what are your thoughts on how hard it is to change the constitution when you need to? Well, I, I quote Scalia, who Jeffrey mentioned, Justice Scalia, mm -hmm. who typically a constitutional cheerleader did say uh, it was too hard to amend. I think he highlighted that as either the biggest or one of the biggest problems that it is too hard to amend. I think he's right. I think he's right. Uh, if, if it was a little bit easier, you wouldn't want it too easy because then everybody's just flopping around all the time and you don't have any of the coherence that Jeffrey, I think correctly put that you need to have that cohesion um, in a polity with underlying principles and rules. But Joyce, I, I think that it's important to make changes over time. And if we could calibrate it to be a little bit easier, but not too easy, I think that'd be optimal. One yeah, of the he, things, Joyce, one of the yeah, things okay. I, I think happens, and this is just human behavior, is we're not going to change the Constitution until there was sort of a welling up of popular consent that X, whatever that might be, needs to be changed. When that happens, when that sort of point gets reached, then things do get changed. But the fact that it doesn't happen says that either people aren't paying attention or they just don't think uh, that X should be changed. But it's it's my assessment of American history that when there is something that is a big deal that the forces change, then change arrives and you can think of all sorts of examples i mean slavery being a certainly the, uh, perhaps the prime example but you think of things like uh franklin roosevelt's new deal and the role of government in american life and all that kind of thing that changed with the new deal and why did it change because of the great depression and the feeling that the government had to play an active role um, you can go through one instance after another in our lifetime it was the Vietnam War, and that sort of gradually snuck up on Americans, and then all of a sudden, 
they realize they've got what 50,000 or X number of thousands of troops in Vietnam and uh, their kids are going off and the thing doesn't look winnable and they wonder what's going on and an anti-war movement comes and, and things eventually change. And Jeff, but that's that's my concern. I mean, again, I hear what you guys are saying, but my concern is that there has to be so much misery, suffering, and death before we change something that ought to be changed. I mean, and even you get to this a little bit, even the way our government is constructed, the separation of powers means nobody, I mean, it's very hard sometimes to get things done. I mean, if I were desperate, I could just order it tomorrow, right? But because we have this separation of powers and one can't act without the other, it really means we get stuck sometimes dealing with problems that should be easily solved, to again, to prevent suffering and, and death. Well, I, I, just, I, I just think, Joyce, that when the American public comes to that conclusion about X, it happens. And it sweeps through the House. It sweeps through the Senate. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, there may be debate and everything, but it happens. If the American public is not sold on X, it doesn't happen. Yeah, but that's another thing Will brings up, too. Um, part of what we're dealing with, too, Will, and talk a little bit more about this, is that you can't always count on the American public to do the right thing at the right time. Um, education. We're not always paying attention. Informed citizenry is the foundation of a democracy. We already know so much of our citizens are not informed or they're ill-informed. How does a democracy function? How does the American democracy function when we have such misinformation and disengagement of the American public? I think that's one of the, the most important questions we can be asking right now. And my thesis is that one of the main reasons that we're struggling as a democracy and as a polity is because more and more Americans neither know nor care how the country's supposed to work. The basics of civics, following the facts of the news and not just the hysterical opinions, uh, those are all things that underpin our democracy. And over time, a population more and more unmoored from reality and the principles of government, that's going to lead to a government that's not functioning the way it should. And I think we're already starting to see that. Well, yeah. you know, th this would be this would be an area where I think we may have some agreement. Um, I, and I've mentioned this, maybe I've mentioned this to Joyce before, I forget. But years and years ago, I saw a poll of, I forget whether it was high school or college kids. They thought Lyndon Johnson was president during the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> well, it and was a long it's time scary. Ago. The things you I, see that people believe in the polls it's really scary sometimes. Yeah, I mean, and and what this says to me is that Americans don't know their own, they don't know history, well, let alone their own history. And that is is a real problem because, you know, the, the whole thing about, you know, if you if you don't learn history, you're condemned to repeat it, I think is true. And, and we just don't know. I mean, if you've got people that have no idea I'll just throw one out at random, and I'm not a gun owner, but if they have no idea what the Second Amendment is, well, that makes it a little hard to have the discussion about, you know, what to do with the Second Amendment. That applies to all kinds of things here, but this is, I think, a real education problem, and uh, I'm not really sure how to how to fix it. Well, I was going to ask Will. Will, what? I mean, as you, you've given this a lot of thought. Do you have any ideas about how to fix this particular issue that we're talking about? The American public seeming ab ability to be fooled, I mean, to just have misinformation thrown at them and to believe it. But in addition, they're not, as you point, so many don't really care. Yeah, I've been asked that a lot over the last few months talking about the book, and it's really, really hard. I mm. think the three of us are all searching for answer. I mean, how do you take a populace of 330 million people where tens and tens of millions of them are entrenched in an ideological camp, sort of immune to factual developments that might change their opinion? They're not focused on civics or the rules of the country. They're just cheering for their side or they just don't care at all. They're busy focused on their own lives or celebrity reality television or sports or whatever maybe how do you take that big huge polity and shake it and say listen we need to start paying more attention um 
I don't have an answer. I don't have a full swap solution other than really start at the beginning with schools. Joyce, you mentioned schools. More funding, more focus, more value in the schools. And then just hope and ethos flows from there as people grow up and that there's more concern for the basic civics. Well, you do one talk a little bit. That, Go one ahead. One of the things that concerns me, Joyce, is that the kind of things we're talking about now have been around for a, a while. What has not been around for a while is social media. Yeah. Bingo. And, you know, if I wrote a post that said, I sat down for a meeting with Joyce Davis today, and it always amazes me that she's eight feet, seven inches tall. <laughs> You know, this goes everywhere, and everybody. I didn't it's know. Reposted I mean, and reposted, yeah, and yeah, yeah. and you, you just. Yeah, I mean, I this is this is a crazy situation, and there's no repealing this. I mean, that we are we are stuck in this, and sadly, I think it's only going to get worse. Well, Jeff, I mean, for you, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, go ahead, but you brought up also the role of media in a democracy. So take take it away with that. I mean, it's education, but it's also media. I'm surprised, Jeffrey, you haven't read my book yet because you just uh, articulated one of my main points very, very well. <laughs> we we have age old problems like human bias and some of the political structures like the two party system has been around for a long time. The new thing is the Internet and social media. That's this century, right? That's 25 years, which is a little blip in the long continuum of of our democracy. And that, to me, is really exacerbating problems that were already there. So people were already biased. We already had a system with some challenges. It gets turbocharged when you can go on social media and say Joyce Davis is eight feet, seven inches tall. And you can say a, a bunch of other things and nobody's concerned about verifying it. People are in their own ecosystems where they're hearing other people repeat things they already believe with, which exacerbates bias. I think if there's one factor that's there's many factors at play here, but the one factor that's changed that's really accelerated the problem, I think, Jeffrey, you're exactly right. I think it's the Internet and social media. And of course, our Constitution doesn't address social media at all. And yet, <laughs> and even our government, even our government is grappling to how to deal with this phenomenon. Right. And yes. whether it should be regulated or not regulated. I mean, do you talk about that, Will, in your book at all? I don't remember seeing anything about government and social media. I don't talk about regulation of social right. media in any sort of full way. I will say briefly that I think it's very hard to do. Uh, the Internet is very difficult to regulate, and you're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater if you take too firm of a stance in really any of these areas. So it's a really hard problem. Jeffrey said it's not going away. I certainly yeah. agree. Uh, and you're right, Joyce. I don't think uh, any article of the Constitution mentions TikTok. I'll, I'll have to go. <laughs> I'll have to go read it again to make sure. But uh. right, right, right. Thomas well, Jefferson invented a lot of things, but I don't think the internet was one of them. Yeah, Al Gore did that, as I recall. <laughs> he did. And you know, no one would um, argue or uh, complain that to make things easier for us to talk to each other. And that's what the internet and social media is supposed to do, make it easier for us to connect. And it has truly been a boon, a, a real benefit for people with disabilities. I remember because they feel more included. Zooms, anybody can participate in a Zoom, right? Even if you're right. in a wheelchair or you can't get around. So there are those positive aspects, but there are those negative aspects, but they are impacting our democracy. I mean, and and as you are pointing out, I think, Will, it's part of the reason why it's not working, why things are not working here as well as we had, as well as the founding fathers had hoped, right? Well, you know, jo Joyce, I, one of the things, I, as I recall from my reading of history, is that, is that circa 1920 or so, one of the things that began to change America was the advent of radio. And yes. Uh, you know, I think the Republican convention that year or the Democrat one or both of the conventions, it was the first time that they had been covered by radio. Mm. And, you know, you got people living all over the country who turn in on their scratchy sets and they're listening to the nomination of Warren Harding and who was it, James Cox on the Democratic side. Uh, so in other words, I think we've been there before. Now we're there at this same time sort of point again it's just that uh it's much more intense and much more widespread and uh you know good luck to us 
And unfortunately, much more being used for ill rather than for yes. good, I think. But 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 let's 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 talk a little bit because another issue that at least I was getting into, I was really uh, interested in, is this separation of powers, even between the federal government and the states, and how even all of that devolves into. Talk about is that really still working as 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 intended, Will? Well, federalism is a really central part of our system. I'm guessing Jeffrey would agree with that. And I actually you know, think it's a very important part. I think that in general, you should push decision-making down to local officials who know the people, know the environment, instead of trying to legislate and dictate things from Washington DC, which is you know, often thousands of miles away. Um, that particular part of our system in a lot of ways, I think is still functioning the way it should. Uh, and in some ways it's not. I mean, I think the federal government has gotten very, very large compared to what the, the founders envisioned, although they were afraid of that. They, there was a lot of discussion in the Federalist Papers and elsewhere about the size of the federal government, how important it was to keep the states uh, in check. But that general system, in my view, is still, still there. And you still have a lot of authority both at the federal level and at the local level. Uh, Jeffrey, does that sound right to you? Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, I, I think the federalist system is a good system. Um, you know, I mean, to not to pick on the obvious, but Pennsylvania is not Alabama, which is not Montana, you know, and you, and you, you want to have a system where everybody in their area gets to, you know, choose things as, as opposed to having some, foreign government as it were or government from that's huge and elsewhere we have enough of that with the federal government as it is and i think there's always going to be that sort of back and forth and and balance but i think uh it's not going to be it's it's never going to be perfect but it's a good thing and you know we've all been around this country it's a huge country and uh it's it's different and i'm always sort of amused when we get to presidential election years, I mean, this year, Kamala Harris and uh, the fact that she's got this long record from California, which will probably, my guess, has played not so well in certain parts of this country. But then, you know, you go back. I mean, this just happens over and over and over again. When I was flying to Europe the other week, uh, you know, you got eight hours on the plane and what do you do? And so I'm looking at documentaries. They had two documentaries on Jimmy Carter and the rise of Jimmy Carter, which I found, you know, I mean, having been around and all of that kind of thing, but it was a great trip down memory lane and how suddenly all of America is entranced with Plains, Georgia and how to farm <laughs> peanuts and uh, how to how to clean uh, swamp pools with cat of, of catfish and all of this kind of thing. And uh, I just thought, yeah, that's the America I know. And then you get to Barack Obama. You get to Barack Obama and it's all about Chicago politics or you get to Ronald Reagan and it's about acting and Hollywood. So I, I think that's a good thing. Well, I, I think it's a good thing, except I let me just hear my perspective on it for a moment. Um, having grown up in the Deep South where, you know, there was a different attitude toward toward people like me. If something didn't come, I mean, a governor blocked the doorway so a little girl couldn't go into school. If we left those local regimes to their own devices, sometimes it, it's not a good thing. Sometimes it needs to be that check from the federal government. You know, I agree with that choice. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, I talk about that in the book, how there's this tension in this area. And it's one of the most important tensions in our whole government system. On the mm -hmm. one hand, you want decision-making reposed locally or else you're gonna get bizarre, ignorant yeah. dictates from thousands of miles away. On the other hand, Joyce, your point is extremely important. If you don't have some oversight, you don't have some involvement, localities can abuse things and do things wrong and there's nobody else that's gonna step in. And the constitution and the bill of rights is intended to lay down some really central principles to prevent that. And there's lots of protections there in the Bill of Rights, but it's hard to get it right. And it's just as important to prevent abuse as it is to keep the decision-making local. So it's a real tension in our system and one that requires a lot of thought 
uh, with time. Absolutely. So, so we have identified some ways that things work and some ways that, that what have we missed a, a, from that you've laid out into your book as to your concerns about, you know, the future of democracy in America? Well, I think one of the biggest things in the book and that I'm concerned about is just the polarization and irrationality of the people. I mean, the, the, the extent to which tribalism has taken hold and both sides think the other side is terrible and evil and that their side is great and holds all virtue. I think that's a really, really significant problem. And again, it's rooted in a few elements, right? Age old human bias, structural deficiencies in our political system. We've got two juggernaut rival parties clashing. We've got closed primaries. We've got gerrymandering and then the Internet and social media. When you combine all that together, it's a flywheel that's just accelerating and causing so much discord and irrationality among the people. I would contrast that by this conversation. I think this has been a really respectful, intelligent, thoughtful conversation. And unfortunately, it feels like an outlier compared to so much of the things that you get when you turn on your TV, you turn on your radio, you go to your websites. Uh, and if we could just move more towards this style of discourse and thinking about things, it would be it would be so much better. One, one of the things, and this goes back to social media and television. One of the problems I think we have in this society is it is difficult to have conversations like this because it doesn't attract any viewers and it doesn't attract an audience. We should start yelling you know, at each other just to get views. <laughs> if yeah. if you if if on the other hand, you know, you've got people saying, you know, my opponent's a jerk, people tune in. They want yeah. to hear. And, but but uh, what does that tell you? That to me, that says then we have something wrong with the American people. What is it that we um we applaud? All of that. I mean, I think I'm, it's just human nature, Joyce. I, I think I, you could no, go to any I, other I, country I, in the world and you'd find the same thing. Well, you're well, I was just about to disagree, but now I'm going to agree with you because Will points out that was part of the construct of our country to realize that there is this other side to our natures that needs to be controlled. I'm just thinking we've got too many people right now that don't want to control it. That don't that don't seem to want to bring out the better parts of you know what I, I Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think it's part of human nature to have tribalism and to have a, a strong sense of, of bias. And, and a lot of what we're seeing is a strong, there's strong aspects of human nature. I think what's happened over the last 25 years is it's been exacerbated. It's heightened. And if you look around the, the, the globe, I'm not an expert in every political system by any means. My sense is that in some ways, the United States is in a less rational place than it was, say, when Ronald Reagan was president, for example. I think Donald Trump is a less rational champion of a political party than you're going to find in the leaders in some of the other Western democracies, as an example. But my sense is, yes, this is all a part of human nature. It's just a polity on fire at the moment. A polity on fire. And part of that could be that we are going through lots of turbulence. Things are changing in our society. We are moving from being a much more pluralistic society with regard to ethnicity and race. And we have our first uh, African-American, Asian woman presidential candidate. Lots of things are upending the status quo. Could that also be a part of what we're dealing with? Absolutely. I think that's a great point and definitely a part of the equation. Not to not to mention, Joyce, uh, just to pick up sort of an obvious here, I'm sitting here on a Zoom call on my Apple MacBook Pro, and to my left is my, my uh, iPhone in a perch. You go back X number of years in our lifetime, none of these things existed. Um, so, so now they do, and they are an everyday factor of human life. And yeah, I got to tell you that the, this first hit me when I was doing stuff with CNN. And at that point, their headquarters in New York was adjacent to a, a mall. And I would go over there every night for dinner before I went on the air with Anderson and these people. Well, I remember walking in there 
on one occasion. And suddenly I realized all the people that were walking around me in this mall were on their phone. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, 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 I literally stopped and did a double take. And I think, my God, the world, the world is changing right in yeah. front of me and I'm not paying attention. <laughs> and had you been to, at dinner with someone, both of you would have been on your phones instead of talking to each other. <laughs> that is right. You know, I one other story like that. I went to an event in, uh, I was invited to speak to an event, this was quite a while ago, in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. Well, I'd never been there, and adjacent to it is Scottsdale, and it's yeah. an old west town. So I'm wandering around like a good tourist, and I'm looking, and I'd look over, and there was an outdoor cafe, and there were five or six people at the table having dinner, and you guessed it, they were all on their phone. All on their phone. <laughs> I see that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, we, we are about out of time, but I will. I want to thank Will Cooper for joining. Yes. And we will probably have you back uh, as because you you're again, raised some issues that we weren't even able to get to today. But we'll leave us. What what are the final thoughts you would like to leave our readers and listeners with? Well, I really appreciate your time, Joyce. Great to be here and great to connect with you, Jeffrey. And I think the, the, the message that I have is as we're inhaling all this information over the next few months, in the presidential election, just try your best to decipher facts from fiction. There's so much fiction. Now it's even artificially generated yes. fiction. It's not just a clip out of context. It's complete, completely originated in an artificial way. Just try to separate fact from fiction and then have your views rooted in the facts as best you can. It's hard but I think for voters, especially people that are not already decided one way or the other, really try to focus on the actual facts out there is key. And I hope the more people that can do that, the better. And not only the actual facts, but but the behavior of the people that you want representing you. What kind yes. of person do you want to stand to represent you in the United States of America? I think that's important. Are we treating each other with civility? Are we being kind? Are we being considerate? Jeffrey, you're wonderful. I'm so glad you were able to join us again. It's and good glad to be back. Invitation. All right. Well, we will be here again next week, folks. Stay tuned. There'll be another battle on Battleground PA very soon. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.